Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. What's wrong with you? Don't worry. It's a game. It's a game just like usual. You'll ruin your eyes playing so close to the TV. What are you talking about? Metal Gear Solid 2 is either the best or worst game in the Metal Gear Saga, depending on whom you speak to. Many people who are far more intelligent than I would say it's the worst for legitimate reasons. For example, the gameplay doesn't build upon its predecessors like MGS3, 4, or 5. It doesn't have very memorable boss battles in comparison to series staples like the Foxhound Squad or the Cobra Unit. And of course, you don't get to play a snake for a large portion of the game. Nevertheless, it is not just my favorite Metal Gear game, but it is my favorite game of all time. There is an exclusive quality to Metal Gear Solid 2 that none of the other games have been able to replicate, and once again, that quality might also be, in the eyes of others, its greatest weakness, the narrative. Upon its release back in 2001, Metal Gear Solid 2 was heavily criticized for its multi-layered postmodern plot. Some may say this is a righteous criticism because an overstuffed narrative may turn off some newcomers to a legendary franchise. However, unlike, let's say, the Matrix sequels, which for many had good ideas with poor execution, I am a part of a constantly growing community that believes Metal Gear Solid 2's enigmatic plot was masterfully constructed and fine-tuned to achieve its primary goal. A goal that very few pieces of fiction have ever achieved. And that goal was to encourage the audience to think for themselves. In my opinion, Metal Gear Solid 2 is the gaming world's equivalent of Joseph Conrad's famous novella, Heart of Darkness. Not just because both stories share some common themes, but also because the level of analysis that both stories have inspired, in the forms of videos and essays, is quantitatively unmatched. In my time examining Metal Gear Solid 2 by exploring the thoughts of people like Cat Icarus, Super Bunny Hop, Logo Steve, and Terry Wolf, I found them all using one particular word above all else to describe Metal Gear Solid 2's narrative, or at the very least they alluded to this descriptor in their analysis. And that word is prophetic. In order to explain why Metal Gear Solid 2 is prophetic, I will have to do a series of videos delving into many different elements of this game. Today, I will be focusing on one particular element that many in the Metal Gear Solid fan community have affectionately referred to as the VR Theory. I believe that explaining the VR Theory first will catalyze our collective understanding of this game. It is the most accessible theme for the average player, even if it is the most cliché. After all, how often do we all roll our eyes at the it was all a dream trope? However, in this case, I believe it works. Even though the notion of the VR theory floated around in the <laughs> primordial soup of the internet for a while, it was fully conceptualized on a website called metagearsolid.org, and later expanded upon by the likes of the aforementioned Super Bunny Hop. Links to both the website and Super Bunny Hop's excellent video are in the description. To explain the VR theory in the most basic terms, the events of Metal Gear Solid 2 are an expansion upon that it was all a dream twist. In this case, it was all a virtual reality simulation. VR, huh? Everything from Solid Snake walking on the George Washington Bridge to Raiden seeing Rose in the streets of Manhattan is all fake. Of course, some will try to invalidate this theory right away because the events of Metal Gear Solid 4 prove that the events of MGS2 were all real. However, we have to acknowledge a time before Metal Gear Solid 3 or 4 existed, when all we had was Metal Gear Solid 2. We also have to remember that for years, with every consecutive game in the saga, series creator Hideo Kojima said it would be his last. With this fact in mind, we have to admit that Kojima's will for the franchise has evolved over many years. This means that while MGS4 exists, it doesn't mean that any merit to the VR theory is immediately invalidated. In fact, it serves us well to analyze MGS2 outside the canon of its own series. But why, you may ask? Why would we do that when it's been proven to be wrong? Let me put it to you this way. For those of you who have read Heart of Darkness or have seen Apocalypse Now, the film which was based on the novella, what makes both works so great? It's not what is on the surface. It's in the subtext. It's the symbolism, the themes, the motifs. So today, let's look beyond the surface of Metal Gear Solid 2, as well as the saga as a whole, and dig deeper into Kojima's own Heart of Darkness. 
In order to keep things copacetic, we'll start as close to the beginning as possible and move towards the end. We'll be skipping over the tanker chapter of this game, mainly because there isn't any direct evidence to support the VR theory in this portion of the game. We will be coming back to it later though, because in a certain context, the tanker chapter bolsters the VR theory. Anyways, let's start with Exhibit A, the first codec call between the Colonel and Raiden in the plan chapter. If you happen to be playing this game for the first time and have just completed the tanker chapter, you will eventually hear this exchange between the two. Just a precaution. You are now designated Raiden. All right, Raiden. You've already covered infiltration in VR training. I've completed 300 missions in VR. I feel like some kind of legendary mercenary. Okay, we'll skip that part. There doesn't seem to be anything suggestive about this exchange, aside from Raiden's obvious reference to Solid Snake with the legendary mercenary statement. But, if you skip the tanker and start a new game on the plant chapter, the dialogue during this part of the game changes. Just a precaution. You are now designated Raiden. This will be your first sneaking mission. The arms will naturally have to be procured on site. What may be passed off as an easter egg by some players actually serves a subtle purpose when you take into account a portion of a codec call later in the game. Listen to what Raiden says about the tanker mission to Snake. I've gone through VR training of the tanker mission before. Yeah? Well, I doubt it accurately simulates the events of that mission. And to prove Snake's point, we see several flashbacks to the tanker mission later on in this codec conversation. While we see familiar events, like Snake bungee jumping onto the tanker and Ocelot hijacking Metal Gear, we eventually see a series of clips that were not in that portion of the game. During the tanker chapter, we only secured two firearms, the M9 Tranquilizer and the USP. However, we see Snake annihilating several soldiers with a FAMAS machine gun, a weapon that is only available for usage in Metal Gear Solid 1 and the Twin Snakes. We also see Snake trying to escape the sinking tanker, which differs from the events we played just a couple of hours ago. These scenes and exchanges were intended to maybe not outright suggest that the tanker mission was VR, but build a violent level of cognitive dissonance within both Raiden and the player. So you're saying that VR training is some kind of mind control? Let's look at the beginning of the plant chapter again, when Raiden first swims through the oil fence. Unbeknownst to Raiden, Snake cut the hole in the fence, which confuses him because this was supposed to be a solo mission. When he brings this up to the Colonel, he echoes his confusion, saying it's not a possibility. This is the first of many instances of cognitive dissonance involving the existence of Snake, with the Colonel's apprehension growing with intensity each time he's brought up. But instead of saying that Snake could be dangerous, or prioritizing the success of the mission by encouraging Raiden to seek out help, what does the Colonel say? because they were never a part of the simulation. They're an unknown factor. He was never factored into the simulation. Leave him out of this. Complete your mission according to the simulation. Now, some of you might say that the existence of Snake and the Colonel's remarks to him might disprove the VR theory. After all, why would those orchestrating the simulation allow an anomaly to potentially deter them from success? In response, I have to ask how exactly Raiden was supposed to get past the oil fence if Snake didn't cut through. Also, how would Raiden be able to gain access to arsenal gear without Snake convincing Olga to help him? This, plus other logistical quandaries, leads me to a single conclusion. Snake was an intended part of the simulation. In fact, he was such an intended part of the simulation that his capacity for heroism is just a bit too unreal. Now what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the scene in arsenal gear when he appears to naked Raiden. Amazing how you walk around like that. Snake! Been waiting long. Okay, where did he come from? Did Snake just come out of the wall? Raiden looks down the hall and sees nothing, and then two seconds later, we see Snake chilling as if he's been leaning there for a long time, almost as if Raiden willed him into existence. And then what happens a minute later? If you run out of ammo, you can have mine. You got enough? Absolutely. Infinite ammo. Yeah, that makes sense. Apparently the world has cheat modes now. Some of you may pass this off as nothing because, you know, Metal Gear has done absurd fourth wall breaks and reality bending in other installments as well. But unlike something like the Psycho Mantis sequence from Metal Gear Solid 1 where at least his abilities are given an explanation, despite them being fictional, Snake having a piece of clothing that makes him, to use his own words, a walking deathmobile just doesn't make logical sense even in the fictional reality this game builds for itself. But above all, consider this. 
If Snake wasn't there to give Raiden encouragement, to show up when Raiden most needed him, do you honestly think that Raiden would have been able to keep his sanity intact to make it to the end? If it weren't for Snake showing up in the belly of Arsenal Gear, reassuring him when he finds out that the Colonel and potentially his girlfriend aren't real people, I don't think Raiden would have been able to maintain a healthy mental state to make it to the end and, like Ocelot said, the project has no room for failures. I'll say it again, Snake was an intended part of the simulation. But you might be asking why would he be an intended part if the Colonel is saying that he isn't? We'll get to that later. I want to focus on some of the latter segments of the Arsenal gear level now, starting with the beginning of the Ray battle. Some people have noted that the arena Raiden fights the Metal Gears in makes no sense geometrically. Where is this place? If it were inside, that would make Arsenal gear unnecessarily hollow for a vessel of its size. So it has to be on the roof, right? Well, I mean, when we look at Arsenal gear from above during the Manhattan crash, where is the arena? I see no glowing floors. Also, Raiden climbs a ladder to get into this arena, right? Where is the ladder? He gets up in the center, but there's no hatch. To drive the point home, Look at this text from the Brady Games Official Strategy Guide for Metal Gear Solid 2 introducing this area of the game. Raiden climbs the ladder out of the Sigmoid colon, arriving at a level that seems ripped straight from one of his VR training missions. And what training mission was that? It was from the special photography stages in Metal Gear Solid VR missions from the PS1. And there are a couple more oddities as well. Right before Raiden gets curb stomped, Olga jumps in like a Power Ranger to save him. Uh, from where? Ocelot is able to shoot Fortune after she spent the previous few hours making Neo jealous, which implies that Ocelot, along with the help of the Patriots, turned off her device, which allowed the bullets to deflect. However, two minutes later, all she does is squat and put out her bare hands, and she deflects Metal Gear Ray's entire payload of missiles. Yeah, and what explanation is given for this? She is Lady Luck. Yeah, okay. Finally, I want to bring attention to the character of Rose, a character that many Metal Gear fans malign as annoying and uninteresting, but her mere existence makes her the most important part of understanding this whole theory. Remember what I said about Snake being an intended part of the simulation because his mentoring and badassness helps us move through a world falling apart at the seams? Rose serves the same purpose. Throughout the game, there are moments where Raiden questions the reality surrounding him, starting with his first encounter with Fortune. Couldn't hit her no matter how hard they tried. And that vampire too, it's... it's like... It's like being in a nightmare you can't wake up from. Jack, snap out of it. And you, Rose. I can't believe you're on this mission. I keep thinking I'll wake up. Raiden, this is real. And that's why you won't wake up. But nothing seems real. I've made up my mind to stay with you. Whether this is real or a bad dream, I'll keep watching you till it's over. Thank you, Rose. And I won't let you be just a dream. That last line is key. Rose is the one thing keeping Raiden's delusion from metastasizing into pure insanity. If there is a chance she isn't real, then what is to stop Raiden from snapping entirely? This would be like proving to a Christian or a Muslim beyond a reasonable doubt that their religion is bogus. Finding out that your entire existence is predicated on a lie is too much for even the strongest amongst us to handle. It starts with Rose telling Raiden that she was an agent of the Patriots. Listen to his tone of voice when he responds. He just doesn't care anymore. He's about to lose his grip on reality, but Thankfully, Snake shows up and mentors him in a way to help him push on. Then, when Otacon proves the Colonel is an artificial intelligence, Raiden questions the existence of Rose as well. Raiden, they've got Rose. What? Rose is being held in the holds. It's a trap. Help! Rose! Raiden, get a grip. But Snake, it's a trap. Since the Colonel doesn't exist, there's no way he can take Rose hostage. Yeah, you're right. I am right. Okay. Uh, does Rose exist? Don't be weird. She's your... What if I've never really met her? What? If the Colonel is something that I partly dreamt up, then everything I remember about her could be... Don't jump to conclusions. You and Otacon are the ones that say the Colonel never existed. Raiden! Is this what Olga was talking about? One quick thing before we get back to Rose. Notice when Snake does his best Admiral Akbar impression, it is proven that he can hear the Colonel's voice. 
Why doesn't he make note of the fact that his best friend's voice, Roy Campbell, is coming through Raiden's ear? Anyways, what this dialogue shows is that everything about Raiden's life prior to the mission can't be trusted. Why in God's name would he question the existence of his girlfriend unless he was euphorically stupid? In fact, later on, Rose makes note of Raiden's desperation for her to be real and insults him for it. Listen to this following exchange. I was just trying not to. What? Trying not to hurt me? Dear, the one you were trying not to hurt was yourself. Avoiding the truth under the guise of kindness is all that you did. By this moment in the video, I believe I've provided enough examples to prove the validity of the VR theory. But there is one lingering question in our minds that must be addressed before we conclude. And that question is why? Why is everything a dream? What purpose could that serve? The answer lies in the final codec conversation of the game between Raiden and the Patriot AIs. The Colonel and Rose explain what the S3 plan is and that a key element of the plan was to see how willing their subject was to follow orders while their reality deteriorated around them. So you see, you're a perfect representative of the masses we need to protect. This is why we chose you. You accepted the fiction we've provided, obeyed our orders and did everything you were told to. The exercise is a resounding success. Your persona, experiences, triumphs, and defeats are nothing but byproducts. The real objective was ensuring that we could generate and manipulate them. It's taken a lot of time and money, but it was well worth it considering the results. What makes this moment scary is not the fact that Raiden has to admit that his entire existence is predicated on a lie, but the gamer has to come to terms with the possibility that everything they have just experienced is a lie as well. Moreover, we also have to admit that we bought into the ridiculous world presented to us with all of its logical inconsistencies, all because we wanted to live vicariously through a badass soldier for a few hours of entertainment. Metal Gear Solid 2 is all about betraying expectations. Whether it's the marketing campaign leading us to believe that we would play the entire game as Snake, or the various examples I laid out in the video. Kojima betrayed all of our expectations because he wanted to empower the individual to question what is presented to us and derive the meaning for ourselves instead of buying into the basic surface narrative. There are some legitimate questions that descend towards the VR theory, like why include story elements like Otacon's family history? Why include that post-credit codec call? There's an awful lot of thought put into the surface narrative that would seem a bit wasted if everything was just a dream. Regardless of whether or not the VR theory is true, I believe I can definitively say one thing. Kojima wanted us to entertain the idea that everything is virtual reality. He wanted the fan community to come to the conclusion that it was both VR and not VR. Though the entirety of Metal Gear Solid 2 was an exercise in control, it was also a lesson in how to break free from that control permanently. And the best way to do that is to build an identity off the truth and let the strength of our convictions triumph in the end. There's no such thing in the world as absolute reality. Most of what they call real is actually fiction. What you think you see is only as real as your brain tells you it is. We can tell other people about having faith. What we had faith in. What we found important enough to fight for. It's not whether you are right or wrong, but how much faith you were willing to have that decides the future. The Patriots are a kind of ongoing fiction, too, come to think of it. Mm -hmm. Listen, don't obsess over words so much. Find the meaning behind the words, then decide. You can find your own name. And your own future. I know you didn't have much in terms of choices this time. But everything you felt, thought about during this mission is yours. And what you decide to do with them is your choice.